Hello everyone, this is Kevin. Thanks for tuning in again to my channel. This is part one of a discussion with Fred Kabagaza on the Word of Faith movement and their doctrines. And is it biblical? This is part one. I don't know how many parts it's going to be, but part two is already scheduled for the 24th of this month. So if you like this, make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for part two that comes out on the 24th. Thanks for watching. Enjoy, guys. God bless you. There we go. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good day. <laughs> I, I thought you had the day off. No, 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 not today. Twenty fourth. Twenty fourth. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's one o'clock. Yeah. Okay. So greetings, everybody. Praise God. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, Fred. Yeah, I remember that now. It was much later in the month. He said his day off was um, the 24th. Yeah. Okay. So how did we end up here at the 10th? Well, I, I asked him if he would be free on Monday around the same time. And he oh, said, okay. yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, sorry, my external camera is off. Let me first turn it on. Well, I also feel like um, maybe we don't want to all three totally bombard Fred, um, whereas um, it might be good to um, get to know where he's coming from and stuff first. So I don't know if we should sure. leave Kevin to that um, and kind of just listen. Sure. And... Um, yeah, because th there's some good parts of that video. You could ask him what he thinks of that. Um, that might be a good way to um, ask him about some of this stuff. I don't know. I don't know if he's seen it. Yeah. Um, another approach we can take is to ask about um, some things like the five solas. Um, yeah, that would probably actually um, be a good question to um, get some idea. You know, because we don't have any idea what you've learned or not, Fred. So um, do you know what the five solas are? Um, not necessarily listing all five, but do you know what I'm talking about? Um, Uh, I beg your pardon, please. Oh, yeah, the five solas. So um, there's sola scriptura, for instance, which means scripture alone. And there's sola. So maybe we um, can type it for him in side chat. So there's five of them. Sola scriptura means scripture alone. Scripture being our um, highest authority that we have here on earth. And then um, sola gratia means grace alone. And that means that our salvation comes by grace alone. So everything that's involved in us being saved came to us by grace. And that brings us to the next one, which is sola fide. I think I'm spelling this right, meaning faith alone. So um, it means that... Um, our salvation, it's taught in Ephesians chapter 2, that our salvation comes by grace through faith. And so um, that's through our trust in Jesus Christ, which brings us to the next one. Sola, what is it, Christi, Christus? Is that right? Solus Christus. Solus Christus with an S there? Yep. But the other ones US. don't have an S, or are they supposed to have an S also? It's just the way that Latin works. I, I don't, I'm not a, but it's, it's solus Christus. Okay, so that's Christ alone. So our salvation is through Christ alone. So there is no savior beside him. And then um, 
finally, what's the last one? Um, oh, Soli Gloria Deo. It's for Sola, the glory of God alone. Gloria Deo. 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 Yeah, Deo. Deo. Um, so Latin solely, for God. solely in this case. So I think it's the declensions. Oh, okay. So this is to the glory of God alone. So it's solely. Um, because it's to the okay. glory of God alone. Um, and Solus Christus is in Christ alone. So the others are just scripture alone. So we're not, yeah. Yeah, so, but, but um, here, let me write those all in English real quick. So what happened? Something's going on. Um, okay, I thought I was doing a shortcut. So yeah, there's scripture alone. And that, have you heard of these? Um, have you heard of these doctrines, Fred, uh, before? Okay, we don't have your audio at the moment. I haven't yet. There it is. Okay, so I think um, that's pretty key for us to know because these are really um, important doctrines. And this is what I was suggesting to Kevin that um, maybe you haven't really been given. Um, a foundation in the Reformation. Um, right. Sorry, just taking a moment here to type things. Okay, so um, do we want to talk about these doctrines first instead and maybe take that approach? Because these are really important. I don't know that we sure. should skip um, this and then confront the other matters. Yeah, uh, Fred, if it's okay, yeah, we can briefly go over the uh, the solas, and then maybe we can um, ask Fred if there's a specific doctrine or a scripture he would like to talk about, and maybe we can exegete it. Okay, maybe uh, I think I need to study, to first make a study about the sola, because the way... Uh, I'm seeing here, uh, sola scripture, meaning by scripture alone, is a Christian theological doctrine held by some Protestant Christian denomination. So I think uh, I'll make, I'll first make a start about it. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we so get that, these doctrines from what's called the Protestant Reformation, um, where Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the Roman Catholic Church and he broke free from the Roman Catholic Church because he had disagreements with the way they were teaching. Um, and this was the cry of the Protestant Reformation. This is why we have Protestants today is because we hold to these specific truths. Um, so this is what modern Christianity, well, I should say this is what real Christianity has always been founded on, but Martin Luther reunited it, uh, reignited this fire when he nailed the 95 thesis to the roman catholic church in germany yeah and um that's kind of a simplification because it happened over the course of decades that as they wanted yes. to solve some <laughs> corruption problems in the church it came to the point that the gospel itself was at stake and um so so then that would be another question is um maybe what your perspective is on the catholic church too so there's this yeah there's so much difference in perspective from here to there that i think there's a lot to um in our country yeah i think i think so you know um and not only by country but even here i mean right down the street there might be some people here where i live who would be drawn to a different sort of church and they might not learn these doctrines so let's go one at a time. Let's start with um, maybe um, faith alone or Christ alone. Okay. Um, um, Christ alone, I think, is the best place to start. Um, so what the doctrine of Christ alone is, is that we're saved in Christ alone. Do, do you know more about it, Graham? Um so a, a good way to summarize this is by comparing it um, to Catholicism. So Catholicism adds the church, um, adds, um, well, it adds works, which we'll get to with, with grace and faith. Um, but it adds 
the saints. It adds, um, it adds all of these other things. Whereas biblical Christianity teaches that Christ on the cross said, it is finished. The work necessary to redeem us was done by Christ. And what we mean by in Christ alone is that it is the work that Christ has done on the cross. There is nothing to be added to that. Um, this is in terms of salvation. Yes. So providing for our salvation. <clears throat> yeah, Fred, I'm sure if, if you Googled um, all these terms, I'm sure like you could find a lot of articles talking about the Protestant Reformation and why they had it. And there's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, so do you understand like the doctrine of Christ alone? Do you understand what that means? Christ alone, is it mm -hmm. uh, something concerning, uh, like, for example, uh, when, you look, when you read in the book of uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 12, the Bible says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there in no, is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. So, uh, it means in Christ, in Christ, no other, no Muhammad, no what, no what, no Buddha, is where we find salvation. Yes. It's only in Christ alone. It's That's right. Only in Christ. Amen. No, not uh, witchcraft. Because I have seen a number of people here in Uganda, they trust different, you know, different things so that they, in order to save them. Uh, one musician here in Uganda uh, came up and said, uh, okay, if I may take you on part of our political issues. One musician here in Uganda said that the president of Uganda Gave, the, gave him life, you know, because uh, he claims to say that any time he can take it away. You, you understand? But uh, according to my perspective, it's not the president that gives life. It's not the king that gives life. It's not any other that gives life. You know, uh, we have seen rich people, they, res they try to resist death. Yeah, But uh, you find uh, in their homes, when they try to face, okay, some, some rich men, some rich people, they try to, you know, to make fences on, on their houses, to put barbed wires, electric barbed wires on their fences, to, in order to prevent thieves from entering, you know, robbers from entering their houses. But they cannot resist death. You know, when death comes, it comes and takes your, their lives. You know? So, there's no way how you can, uh, one can say that the president is or has given him life. It's only God who determines whether you die or not, or you live. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30 and verses 16, God gave us two options, you know, life and blessing, death and curse. So we choose where we fall, you know. We can decide either to be on the side of death and choose evil, Oh, we can decide to be on the side of life and we choose blessing, you know? So, 
there is a way there is a uh, an, uh let me say an arrogant way how people uh take uh things for granted uh the things of uh the life okay let me say life how they take life for granted because they think that the things of the of the earth are the finals you know but what what did jesus say when he was living he said i'm going to prepare for you a place you know so it means that it, there is life after death and that life is in christ alone no other no? exactly yeah. and then um Yep. When you speak of choosing life or death, then you brought it to um, its proper application that we choose Christ, we choose in him. And then that brings us to the next point would be um, faith alone, because we put our faith in him alone. Um, and also in response to what you were just saying, that um, God puts the choice before us, life or death. And then we ha it's... Um, through faith in him alone. And because the choice is life or death, good or evil, but we have to choose him because none of us qualifies as good. We fall short and qualify as evil instead. We need him to atone for our sins. And so that's why it's in faith alone and it can never be of works. Amen. Which maybe I jumped the gun explaining it myself instead of asking. Instead of no, asking you were right, Nick. First. I mean, there's none good. There's none that seeketh after God. Um, so does that make sense, Fred? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it shows how I was associating Christ alone with faith alone in that there's no other besides Christ, which means he's the only one worthy of our trust that we put faith in him. And therefore, we can't work to it because it's in Christ alone. So we have to do it. We have to put our faith in him so that it's in his finished work, so that he's the one who does it. Yeah, Jesus, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, if at all we are, to, actually, uh, let, let me bring it like this. In, if at all we are to, receive or to get eternal life eternal life it's only through christ jesus mm. we are supposed to go through the process of one accepting christ to be our personal lord and savior two believing in his father god and to walk According to God's will, doing what exactly what God wants us to do. Yeah? Which is trusting His Son. Yeah, trusting right. in His Son, believing in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then to acknowledge that God sent His Son. To come and die for us. Absolutely. And then, um, so it sounds like um, all the distinctions are correct there. That um, because we're not saved by the works, but we go on to the works after being saved. I think I heard you um, describing that. That um, okay. When we get saved, it's not only about getting saved, but we have to, 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 to show the works of a saved person of a person who really accept jesus those are the actions that we have to push or to to show the world that truly jesus do exist 
by doing exactly what Jesus would have done when he, if he's still here or if he's here at, at the moment. Jesus works in, uh, into us. He works through us so that we can manifest what exactly he would have done to the, to, uh, to the people. That's why he said that I'm sending you, go, preach the, the, the gospel, lay hands to the sick, and they will be healed. It means that his power is in us, and he expects us to do according to his will, not according to our will, because I've seen a number of people they claim uh, to be prophet, and yet what they are doing does not correspond with what Jesus requires of them to do. Could some we go through some verses on the gospel? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Romans 10, 9. Would that work? Yeah. I think that'd be useful. Sure. So I've got Romans Romans 10, 9 up. Um, so Fred, do you mind reading this for us? Romans 10, 9. Okay, no problem. Romans, Romans 2, 9. So just from verse 9 here, from following that. Okay. okay, tribute, tribulations and anguish upon every soul of man has done evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. Okay, I'm not I'm not sure what you're seeing on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's reading um, from oh, his oh, own oh. Bible in front of him, but sorry, sorry. that wasn't I was, ten nine. I was reading two nine. <laughs> okay. Romans Romans ten nine. Okay. Sorry. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and the Lord Jesus, I mean, if that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So these are two of the things that we need to believe. This is our faith needs to be in that Jesus is God, and I can show that from the context here, that the Lord here is referring to Yahweh, not to Adonai, which is a more general term. Um, this is we need to say with our mouth that Jesus is God. So we're trusting Jesus as God. And it needs to be that Jesus is God because only God is good. So only God can come and pay for sins. And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. It's essential that Jesus raises from the dead because otherwise he was a false prophet. Um, and what he said was not true. So these are two of the essential truths that we need to have to be born again. Yeah? Yeah. That makes sense? You, you agree with the, the way that I've explained that? Or is there a, another way that you would look at it? Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8. Am I speaking too fast? Um, so Romans 10, 9, did you understand what I was saying about what we need to believe from this verse? We, we have to believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, but we have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. We have to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, which means Jesus is Yahweh. Right. Jehovah. Yeah. You understand that? Yes, I do. 
and believe that God raised him from the dead. So he has to be resurrected from the dead by God as confirmation of everything that he said, that he is um, he is God's messenger. He is he is the Christ. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Ephesians two, eight and nine. Okay, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, the gift of God. Not no. of God, yep. lest any man should boost. So here we have two of the solas. It's grace alone um, and not, not, not other things. We don't need rituals. We don't need... Um, we don't need anything except God's gift. We're not adding anything to yeah. what to God's work. It is finished. It's, this is this ties in with Solus Christus as well. That it's Christ alone. Christ is the gift. He is the gift that we can't even describe. We we have no words for how great a gift He is. That's God's grace to us, and it's faith alone in that there are no works that we offer. There's nothing that we can do except trust him because it's all of grace. It's all God's work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then works follow verse 10 for we are his workmanship. So we are God's work, a work that God has done created mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus unto good works. So the works that we do is God doing them. We can't do the works of our own, of our own effort, of our own ability. We haven't been created into creatures that can operate independently of God. It must continue to be by faith. There's many verses that talk about that as well. But works follow, and, and you were saying that, so I'm just confirming that this verse says that as well. Once we are born again, the good works will follow. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, that's exactly it. Amen. So, so we've got Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone. It's, it's all of God's work. Yeah. And we have scripture alone. So it is only the word of God that we rely upon, the writings that God has given us in these 66 books. And we add nothing to it. There's no new revelation. God's not speaking directly to people except through his word and the Holy Spirit, as we study God's word and submit to the Holy Spirit, God is speaking to us through scripture. Amen. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I understand. Well, and I think, the last. Um, what sola scripture almost um, properly is, my understanding is that scripture is the highest authority that anything else can be tested by yes the um the sole infallible authority that we know we can trust for sure because god has handed down the preserved scripture to us and so um that's what i was referring to yesterday about being a good berean that's very much in the spirit of sola scriptura to or uh, maybe it wasn't yesterday but recently about being a good Berean to um, test whatever we're told by scripture. And um, yeah, that's where Sola Scriptura comes in. Remember when we uh, showed you the Bereans in the um, scripture, Fred? Yes, yes. <laughs> and they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received what Paul told them readily. And they also went to the scripture to test whether or not those things were so. Or whether or not those things were correct. Yeah. Amen. So yep. then that brings us to the one that's probably the hardest to convey. That's to the glory of God alone. And this is, this is focusing on the fact that God is 
God. He is supreme over all of this universe. He's the creator. He owns everything. He is completely independent. He needs nothing. There is nothing that can be added to who he is or what he does. Um, and so everything needs to be to God's glory and only to God's glory. God is a jealous God who will not share his glory. And that's right and proper because he is God. Right. There is no worship or even hint of worship, no praise in in this sense, uh, I might need to be a bit careful how I explain this. Ultimately, all praise goes to God. So we can we can thank someone for being kind, for something that they may do, for a gift that they may give. But ultimately, our praise, our worship, our our glory, what we what we treasure, what is important, must be God Himself. And so even the thanks that we have to other people is for how God is using them to do something good. Yep. Amen. Well said, Graham. Yep. So on the script, Sola Scriptura point, um, if you read in Revelation, it says that, uh, if anyone adds or takes away from the prophecies of this book, and I don't just um, consider that to be talking about the book of Revelation. I think of it as the Bible as a whole. So when people claim that they are a prophet from God operating in the office of a prophet, when they speak something God has said, technically they are speaking new scripture. And that goes against um, the Bible. That would be opposed to sola scriptura because they're they're saying new scripture. You, you know what I'm saying, Fred? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So sola scriptura is very important. The canon of scripture is closed. There is no new revelation given. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you have seen a number of uh, pictures uh, moving around social media, but. Uh, there are some people, or oh, some they, they call they are called prophets. They make, you know, they make people to eat grass. What? Yep, I've seen it. Oh wow! Yeah. They make uh, there is a, also another liquid that they make they make them drink, claiming that they are going to be healed. And there are some uh, so-called, again, prophet, they say, take this water and you will be healed. You know, they say, uh, some, still some prophets say, come and say, you woman, I'm seeing you. You man, I'm seeing you. The woman you have is not yours. The man you have is not yours. You should divorce that man, and God will bring you another woman or another man. I've seen such people. No, I've seen people or prophets coming up and say, "Bring what you have, all the money you have in your business, and God is gonna is gonna multiply it." And people run bankrupt. Also, such people who come up and claim they are prophets. So, uh, Fred, do you do you believe that there are prophets today? According to me, actually, it's still uh, bothering me. I think a prophet. I don't know even how I can explain it, but to me. I think a prophet is that kind of person um, okay okay 
Okay, let me <laughs> let me leave it. Let me say it like this. Prophecy in this generation. I think to me it it must be it must appear in three people all, yeah, so that that prophecy that prophecy can be fulfilled. Like uh, my come up or someone may may come up and say, "Fred, something this and this is gonna happen to you." And then still another person may come in and say, "Fred." This and this is going to happen to me. The same thing. Maybe God can use another person and come up and say, Fred, this, is an, this and this is going to happen to you. That's the prophet said that I believe. Um, so, Fred, I would say that there are no prophets in the sense of God speaking directly to people. The only prophets that we have today are people who declare what God's word has to say. Yes. So God's direct revelation to us outside of scripture is finished. Scripture is God's revelation to us. So there are no there are no people hearing from God unless they're hearing it from scripture. That the Bible is God speaking to us. And that's the only way that God still speaks to us. Really in the word of God. It is the word of God right. and rightly understanding the word of God by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. So yeah, I would say that there there are no prophets today in in that sense, right. unless we want to call people who proclaim God's word, who are preaching God's word, if we call them prophets. But it might be better if we didn't call them prophets, so that there's less confusion. Right, and I, and I was going to distinguish that too. The the difference between see, there's there's the office of the prophet, right, where a prophet was someone that God used to give his revelation to write scripture and then there's the gift of prophecy where people preach a message of repentance like jonah did to the ninevites in the book of jonah right he gave him a word of prophecy repent or you're gonna god's gonna destroy the city so a prophet preaches a word of repentance someone who stands in the office of the prophet actually gives new revelation they're they're giving scripture um so yeah like graham was saying in the office of the prophet it doesn't exist today like it did back in biblical um times um <clears throat> hebrews 12 1 says god who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets but has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds so in times past god spoke through the prophets but today god speaks through his son um so we don't need prophets anymore because we have Jesus. Yeah. Right. And that's why I was concerned. I was watching your broadcast the other day, and there was a man on your um, broadcast, and he was preaching, and he was claiming to be a prophet. Um, and that was very troubling because I kept listening to him, and he started speaking all um, sorts of heresies, and it made me uh, concerned, and that's why I reached out to you about it. Even in Hebrews, it's put in the past tense, hath, past tense, in these last days spoken, past tense, unto us by his son. How has God spoken unto us by his son? Scripture. Jesus has been here on earth, and the record that we have of that is scripture. God's word is complete. God is not still speaking except through scripture. Yeah. Amen. And 2 Timothy 3.17 would underscore that as well, that it's scripture that is sufficient for us to be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
it's three absolutes there. Complete, absolute, scripture alone. Thoroughly equipped. That's absolute. For oh, all, we, we should have this on screen, word. right? Hmm. Yeah, and that, that gets back to the, the doctrine of, of sola scriptura, the yep. efficiency of scripture alone, and there's no new revelation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How profitable? That the man of God may be perfect, which means complete. It doesn't mean sinless here. Thoroughly furnished truly furnished but thoroughly equipped for every good work unto all good works three absolutes we need nothing more than scripture except the holy spirit who works through scripture but we're not adding him to scripture the scripture and, um, is him speaking and um at the very least even if um you know you're not prepared to change your perspective that much today what's good about scripture is that what god is teaching us through scripture is always assured and um whatever someone else is teaching us um like i'll tell you the truth fred i'm not really willing to um learn from people at all because i've been let down so many times from different people but if they'll bring me to scripture and then together we can learn from scripture and learn from god who is our teacher so maybe we should go to where jesus said not to call any man on earth teacher because he is our teacher and just um i'd be interested to know what you think of that yeah just um Fred, are you aware of the scripture I'm referring to? That um Way well, said <clears throat> uh, So here it is, um Matthew chapter twenty three. Verse eight. And again in verse ten, actually. Yeah, and there is a context here that he's talking about two specific people. But I think this principle that he says, be not ye called rabbi, which means um, teacher. It's like a teacher who would have disciples. Um, yeah, but be ye not called, so we could say teacher there, be ye not called a teacher. For one is your teacher, Christ, and all of ye are brethren. That is brothers. And so um, this idea that we're all on equal footing, except that Christ is the head. And then he says, and call no, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. And that's pretty straightforward stuff that we only have um, one father over us who is the source of our new birth. And then... Um, well, that makes it hard to read. Sorry, I was just trying to check what the word master and the word rabbi was. So rabbi is rabbi. And then master might be teacher. Um, neither be ye called masters, kathagates, guide, teacher, master. Oh, I thought you okay. meant the other part where um, he responded to the word rabbi with teacher in verse 8. Yeah, he did. Okay, um, same thing, yeah. It is, Kathagatos. Yeah, so he says, be none of you called rabbi, because one is your teacher, Christ. And then he says, call no man on earth your father, because one is your father in heaven. And then he says, neither be any of you called teachers, for one is your teacher, Christ. Yes. And then he does go on, but he that is greatest among you shall be least. And so he weaves it in with some other points. But this specific point that we have one teacher, Christ. And so we can always go to scripture to see what God is teaching us through scripture to test anything we're given. 
Um, that's important because we do everything by trusting in Christ, right? And so we may not know if we can rely on each other, but we always know we can rely on the scripture. And if we're trusting Christ, then we're going to know that the scripture is bringing us what Christ is bringing us. So you see why that's so important. That's how we, one of the best ways that we have to walk in faith is to walk in accordance with the scriptures and to use the scriptures to test whatever anyone brings to us. Yep, just like the Bereans would do. You know, don't don't just take anyone's word for it. Look it up for the scripture and see if it'd be true through the scriptures. See what God says. Right. And maybe, um, I don't know, Kevin, if you want to um, start reviewing the video with Fred and seeing what he thinks of some of what Justin Peters is addressing. Um, I mean, we could do that. Um, should I start it from the beginning? or, or um... Yeah, I guess so, unless there's a specific spot you want to go to. I don't know. Um, it, it might be a bit of an ongoing discussion. You guys have, might have to do another episode. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, depending yeah, on how long it. Fred plans to stay around. <laughs> yeah, Fred, how long did you have uh, to stay today? Hope we we don't get sound from you yet, Fred. Yeah, you're on, you're muted. I was Fred. hoping he was already working on it, but I do have four hours uh, to go back for the day. So I need to head for bed. Um, I have emailed both of you um, with some scriptures I think might be useful, um, and I've bolded some sections in them so. If you want to use those, otherwise um, we could go through them next time you and I can talk, Fred. Um, okay. Well, yeah, Fred, by the way, this is uh, this is Graham. He's a Bible <laughs> speaker. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> How long have you been uh, preaching for, Graham? Uh, yeah, 20 years. Yeah. Um, to varying degrees. Always yeah. learning, um, um, and, but hopefully I have come to a knowledge of the truth. Yeah, um, but yeah, you should uh, sub to his channel. I'm sure Gra Graham would be glad to talk to you anytime. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have you c come on and visit um, anytime that. Yeah, okay. I'm streaming and and we can have a conversation. I, I I just try to teach God's word. I want people to understand what God has to say, and I'm I'm trying to learn as well. Um, but I just want to share what I believe God's taught me. Okay, that's good. Um, and I've just noticed that Second Peter 1, 16 to 19, 20, 21 might be useful for you as well, if you want to ah. look at that. But I'm, I'm going to go. <laughs> okay, Graham, no problem. Thanks for being here, bro. I'll talk to you later. So, yeah, um, start yeah. up here and go to the end of the chapter. 116? Right. Yep. God bless you. Bye. See you. Okay. Bye. Yeah, because I think um, another important step is to um, establish a foundation on the gospel, like together, you know, yes. and not necessarily just be totally stressing our differences. Right. Because, um, yeah, Fred, one thing that I wanted to convey to Kevin, which I think is accurate, is just that um, from your perspective, you haven't necessarily been taught the different things that we've been taught. And um, so, therefore, I, I think um, it's more a matter of discussion and then introducing you to things. And hopefully you're interested to um, learn more in that direction and building things in proper order rather than um necessarily trying to suddenly confront it all at once you know because these are big topics and they take they take time to talk about in an honest way you know mm -hmm. so um okay so 
Kevin, yeah, if he has a good amount of time, I think it'd be good for you guys to put on the video and um, just kind of um, talk about some of this stuff and get an idea of, you know, um, what we're talking about, right? <laughs> get, get... <laughs> yeah. Um, it so open far... up. It'd be a good way to open up the discussion. Um, based on the examples that are on screen. Yeah. Okay. So Fred, when I asked you about the word of faith, um, so here in America, the word of faith movement is um, heretical. They teach all sorts of things that are foreign to scripture, such as like we are gods and we have the ability to speak things into existence and that Adam was a carbon copy of God um they there's a lot of wrong things in there and i just wanted to if we can go through the video you could tell me like where you agree or disagree with them and the things that they believe because i just wanted to make sure um that you understood <laughs> where i was coming from when when i said word of faith like what i mean by it mm -hmm. like um do you do you believe that um we're, we're gods yeah, of course I do. I do believe we are the gods. Okay. Well, um, there's many scriptures in the Bible that says that uh, the Lord says, I am God and there is none beside me. Um, when these people say we are gods, they're quoting from Psalms. And the when they say it's read that ye are gods, it's, it's referring to them as judges, like they are gods to the people. It doesn't mean that they are literally um, gods. Well, I have a good idea for this one thing. Let's put that scripture on screen. Um, uh, here, I'm some... looking on it. On my end here, I got it. Oh, you got it? Wow, you're fast. Okay, let me share your... Well, I got to pull it up still, but it should be pretty easy. Ye are gods, which yep. will appear in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yes, and then, um, okay, well, brought up more than I intended, but where is that? Is like Deuteronomy 32 or something? No, I'm pretty sure it's in the Psalms. Oh, the Psalms. Okay, this makes more sense. Yes, yes, right here in Psalm 82. So um, let's get the full chapter here on screen. And then it says here, this is the beginning of the Psalm, Psalm 82. And it says a psalm of Asaph. So I think Asaph is a person. But let's begin. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Salah. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy rid out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge of the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, him specifically. And um, it's a privilege that we can enter under his lordship and partake in it, but it's talking about him. So I hope that kind of brought into context when people are quoting this, ye are gods, what kind of scripture we're, we're really reading from. But uh, does it really mean that uh, because chapter 6, that chapter 6, I have said you are gods. And here down it says, and all of you are children of the Most High. I really need uh, some more clarification. Yeah, and then it says... But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So what this is, is he's rebuking the judges of Israel for um, being wicked instead of doing justice. 
And so he's saying that he has put them in this role, but, you know, that he has put them in this role of partaking in his own work, and they are children of the Most High. He's referring to them as gods, even, in reference to them being his children. Mm -hmm. But because they have not done right, he says they will die like men and, and uh, fall like one of the princes. Yes. And then it comes to prophesy specifically about Jesus here. Arise, O God, judge of the earth for you shall inherit the nations. So there's a contrast here between Jesus and these who are condemned, who he's calling gods here. Um, so what he says about them being gods is similar to what I was saying about it is a privilege that we get to take part in Jesus's kingdom, but then we have to be responsible with that. That's really the lesson being taught here. So I don't know if that helped some, because I know it's a difficult text right here. Yes. Okay. Uh, what does uh, John chapter 10 verse 34? Would you mind displaying it on the screen? John chapter 10 verse 34. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so right here, this is where Jesus is quoting it. Yep. And, um, well, that makes the point, right? Because he's really the one who's mentioned next after. So um, what's going on straightforwardly here is that Jesus is declaring himself as God. Um, I take it that you probably already understand that, Fred? Or is that not necessarily the case? Because um, here, let's get this in context. Um, are you aware of the context here, Fred, of this section? Mm -hmm. That um, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Um, that was for other claims <laughs> that he's God, basically. Yeah. But we'll, we'll jump in here in the middle because um, it goes on for quite a while in this chapter. <laughs> um, Jesus answered them, many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, and because that you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, whom the Father has set apart, who the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said, I am the Son of God. So um, there's actually... So what he is saying here, his point is not whether or not they're gods, but his point is whether or not he himself is blaspheming. He says, you guys are accusing me of blasphemy. And then he calls this scripture to mind where those who are supposed to be representing God on earth are unjust. And uh, um, so God still sees fit because they are sons of the most high to refer to them as gods in the way in which he means it. So that's something else we can talk about in a second. But then um, they're told they're going to die like men. And then we have the mention of Jesus. Well, this is the one that they're saying he blasphemes because he says he's the son of God, but he's the one that God sent into the world. Right. And so um, I hear I'm like using arm gestures a little bit, but I'm not even on camera. But yeah, so, um, so we see that um, how much the reference that he was referring back to actually ties together with the things he was saying. This one, arise, O God, has come into the world, and when he calls himself the Son of God, they say he's blaspheming, even though right here, God was willing to call people who were essentially their equals in another era gods. Um, but this isn't teaching anything about their supernatural nature or anything. This is more um, that God's willing to participate with them. Um, now we do have the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, That's God indwelling us. That doesn't make us a God. 
Yeah, and there's a distinction between ourself or the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Right. Because it's that we conform to God. Do you know what the word conform means, Fred? Um, conform means we change to be more like. So to conform to be like Jesus means we change over time to become more like Jesus. Yeah. And um, so that's the distinction, too, that it's not like we're becoming more like ourselves. We die to self and become more like Jesus. Um, yeah, so when um, when we're given the privilege to participate with God in his work, what we read here is that that's a big responsibility to take. Um, but going back to the scripture that you're at in John 10, where he references it from there. So that's what I mean by another thing is we want to take it as intended, right? So what does God mean when he says that they are gods? Does he mean that um, anything about their supernatural abilities or anything that's inherent to them apart from himself? Um, now, Jesus refers to what he means by it. I think this could be debatable, but check this out. He says... Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, so forth and so on. So what he's saying is that they were called gods because it was unto them that the word of God came. This has to do with them. They were given a privilege to represent God on earth and they squandered that privilege and did it wrongly. And so Jesus is c comparing them to that scripture and comparing himself to the one who arrives to inherit the nations. Amen. Well said, okay. Nicholas. Amen. Okay, one question. Uh, I would like to question, uh, to ask. Uh, okay, do you think uh, people do tend to call to to take themselves in the image of God? Um, what exactly is the question? Do people really tend to take themselves to be in the image of God? Since the, since okay. the Bible says uh, God created man in his own image. Right. Yeah, and then um, that is a good question because, um, well, one way that we talk about that sometime is that we are his image bearers so that that again is our responsibility that um you know um you know um where the boy um okay a coin right this word shouldn't appear too much in the new testament i know it does a number of times but oh, wait it doesn't even appear once well, I would like to say that being created in his image doesn't mean he made us um, a god. It means that we are his prized possession. Yeah, you know that part where he says um, whose image is on this coin? So what yeah, word am I looking for there? Oh, uh, inscription, I think. Okay, that'll help. Or you, do you know where it is? Uh, it's in sure. uh, Mark, I think. Okay, um, the taxes inscription on coin Jesus. Matthew, um, okay, I'll go with Matthew 22. Okay. Uh, about yeah. verse 20 or so. Okay, so, and... Look at how much a privilege it is that we have this technology that I was able right. to jump around <laughs> on all that. Yep. So, I mean, you got it on the screen. Good. So, yeah, even when I don't know how to find it, we figure it out pretty quickly. Um, right about verse 19 or so. So, um, tell us, therefore, what think you? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Okay, I'll go ahead and read it um, from the start of this even though I don't know if I'm going to make the most direct application, but this is going to help me convey a point about the image of God. 
So then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him, that is Jesus, in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians. Um, that just means people who were of the King Herod, like working for King Herod, basically. Saying, mm -hmm. saying to Jesus, Master, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Neither care you for any man. And what they mean by neither care you for any man is he doesn't care what people think, if they're going to misjudge him or something. Um, for you regard not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. So we have God's image. We bear God's image. Um, so we are made in the image of God. Um, yeah. But Jesus is the only begotten of God, um, meaning he's the only one who is God born of God. And um, it's only in him that we have access um, to our portion in that. Good point, Nicholas. Yes, we are adopted children. He is the only begotten. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> upon that same question that uh, um, I would love to, to read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 19. Okay. I think I heard you right. Deuteronomy 4, verse 19. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, should we go back just a little bit for a little bit of context? Okay, where we're not to make any likeness of anything. Mm -hmm. So um, take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similarity. I think that's what similitude means. Anyway, I'm on the day Yehovah spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similarity of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that is bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that in the waters beneath the earth. And lest you lift up your eyes unto heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven should be driven to worship them and serve them, which Yehovah your God has divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But Yehovah has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Okay, so you're here on verse 19. And I'm not sure what you want to point out here this time. Um, if you'll explain it, please. Okay. Um, oh, the previous passages... Uh, says do not make anything that god has not uh that is in the likeness like verse 15 take your ye therefore good heed unto yourselves for you saw no manner of simil simil similitude on the day that the lord spoke unto you in in horrible out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourself and make you, you a graven image. 
you know so uh, my point is why is it that uh, some people they uh, they worship uh things like uh, like the catholics like the buddhist actually it is more in the asian countries where they think like for example in one country that is uh, nepal you have heard nepal they say they have uh 30 million gods 30 million oh. gods but anything they see they worship it well i think i have an answer for why they worship <laughs> things because um yeah. when it's a physical object they can control it and interact with it and um have that experience and when they don't actually have jesus christ then they're um wanting to convince themselves that there's something going on so they want to interact and can um control their perception of god to comfort themselves about yes. god and um, um that that might be something that might be similar with um some of the motives of why people are seeking miracles and signs today because um yeah that was some of what i discussed earlier before you got here so i don't know if you would ever have the chance to watch um we were reviewing the video before you got here but um that also might be a good way to um have a step in this discussion you know yep and i don't uh, know before we could just I go may, through it again if i may add too is uh um since adam and eve fell uh humanity has been plunged into sin there's none that do good. There's not none righteous. No, not one. So man left to themselves in the flesh, our sinful nature, man always worships things, right? Like there's certain men that worship money. There's certain men that worship their wives or the Egyptians worship cats. You know, everyone makes, without God, everyone has an idol in their life that they worship, whether they realize it or not. So or that's just it be one self, one's own desires. Yes. That, that's just a product of the fall. That's why people worship other things in God. They break the first commandment. They make, they, 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 God says that you shall have no other gods before me. But people always put gods up in their life that um, are a figment of their imagination because there's only one God. And that is just a result of our sinful nature. And that is naturally what man does without regeneration. Yeah, and um, God also wanted um, Israel when he was setting laws for them to set them apart so that um, w one thing is that um, no image can ever live up to who God really is. So because this also has to do with telling them, look, don't even try to make an image of me or any image that somehow lives up to something about me, you know, because he's too... He's too set apart. He is too holy for any such image like that we could ever make to be worthwhile. Um, that's why he set up the temple in such a specific way with the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkling of blood and everything, because it all expresses meaning through the ceremonies. And all of that meaning points to Christ. And um, Christ is actually God making himself obvious to humanity when he um, went to the cross and then also rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. Um, that is the image of God being made obvious for humanity. And so Adam and Eve were supposed to be good image bearers of God, you know, but um, they were not perfect, like Jesus is perfect, and so instead they sinned. And then Israel also, that fell short. And so, um, you know, this is where um, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10 and describe a brief part of this. Not the part we're usually in, Kevin, but um, the context leading up to it. But 
we're not going to get all the way where we usually get because yeah, we don't yeah. need to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I don't know how familiar you might be with the book of Hebrews, Fred, but, um, what's going on is he has described, um, how pre, how Jesus is the high priest for our new covenant in the true temple, which is the heavenly, as opposed to one made with hands on earth, which represented the heavenly. And then he's also our king in the heavenly, and he's also our atoning sacrifice. And um, there's quite a bit that went into talking about that earlier, but it finally leads up to this point. He says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, referring to uh, sacrificing animals in the Old Covenant, which they offered year by year continually, they could never make the those who come unto those sacrifices perfect. Um, for then, would they not have ceased to be offered? That is, if the offerings, the sacrifices had made them perfect, would they not have stopped offering the sacrifices? Because that the worshipers, once cleansed, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance made again of sins every year, because it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, that is Jesus, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not, so you desired not. Um, so he's quoting the Old Testament here. Um, I think I covered my mouth right when I said here, but yeah, he's quoting the Old Testament here. And what he's quoting is when God is saying that he's not satisfied with Israel because they were doing the sacrificial system with an unright heart, basically. Um, long story short. Right. So God told them he was disapproved of their sacrifices. So he worded it this way. Sacrifice and offering. So this is Jesus talking to God. He says, um, sacrifice and off talking to God, the father, that is <laughs> sacrifice and offering you desired not, but instead a body you have prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins you had no pleasure so what jesus is saying when he says you prepared a body for me is literally that he came in human body to be a sacrifice Amen. so this is an amazing section we're reading right here so jesus continues here um and this is the writer um of hebrews referring to these as Jesus's words, as the one who fulfills that there is one who is to come, right? Um, which we talked about when we read Psalms in John chapter 10, that he's the one who's to come and inherit the nations. So then said I, that is Jesus, look, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. So that word order, I don't know if that made it difficult um, for you so i'll just um read it again in a different word order so then said i it is um then said i look in the volume of the book it is written of me i come to do your will O god so jesus is saying i am the one who is prophesied of and i come to do your will you were not sa satisfied with what israel was doing you were not pleased in their sacrifices that I, Jesus, come to be the sacrifice you will be pleased in. And then he even says here, above when he said, so we're going to get repetition here, but the above here is going to tell us that this second statement has um, compensated for the first statement, so that the new covenant compensates for the shortcomings of the old covenant. So he's saying above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, you desired not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, look, I come to do your will, O God. So the coming to do your will is above that God's will before was not satisfied. 
So Jesus comes to actually do God's will with his worthy sacrifice. Amen. Now he takes away the first that he may establish the second, that is the new covenant by which we're saved by his atoning blood directly, not through the shadows, but directly, which is where this chapter goes as we continue on. So, um, yeah, he takes away the first covenant that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Um, so what's going on here is by the which will refers to the will of God that was not sac satisfied by the Israelites sacrificial system. Well, by the system he gave to them because they did it with the wrong heart. But it was satisfied by Jesus coming to do God's will. Right. So. Um, so that's what's going on here is because God's will was satisfied we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once because he satisfied, God, satisfied God's will. And that's the difference here. He satisfied God's will because he really is perfect. He really is God in that way. But Adam and Eve did not satisfy God's will. Even Israel with the whole temple system did not satisfy God's will. And even us in our flesh we fall short of that even now as new creations. We're new spiritual people who in spirit, because Christ has made us new, we do satisfy God's will in spirit, but still not in flesh. And we don't yet see it in full, which is another topic, but I will cease for the moment because that's a lot of <laughs> yeah. Thoughts I hope on you, that? I, yeah, I hope you could follow that, especially the part about him satisfying the Father's will and none of the rest of us doing that. That none of us ever satisfied the Father, but Jesus did. Right. So uh, this implies that uh, the sacrifice of, of uh, the bull the lamb, I mean, the, the bull, the goat, chicken, maybe, just like other people would do in, you know, in the shrines, they say bring chicken. That one was, uh, was covered by the new covenant Jesus, when Jesus came. Yeah, because now that we know that he has actually come and done the true sacrifice, um, he has atoned for us, so it would be an insult if we think we still need atonement. And yep. so it's actually very important that we don't sacrifice animals to atone for our sins. Uh, Nicholas, can you go down to verse 26 where it says there's no more sacrifice for sins? Um, yes, I can. So um, I think it's pretty important to um, do that in context if we want to go there. Oh, but, okay. um, well. But it's a good idea. That is where it gets to the point of it. And okay. maybe um, this is where we sometimes have an advantage is um, Fred perhaps has not been taught wrong on this. So it'll be easier for him to learn the correct <laughs> on it, whereas someone yeah. has been taught wrong. Like I was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So by the which will, that is the will of the father, which was satisfied in Jesus, but not in any other. So by his will being satisfied, to paraphrase what we just read, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. Um, Amen. And by just so you know, Fred, when the words are italicized, it means that the um, it's similar to what we were saying about in brackets in your other one. It means the translators provided it for clarity. Um, and sometimes they're useful, but um, sometimes I skip them just because technically they're not part of scripture right because right. the whole point here is that the sacrifice is once so that you don't need a sacrifice again and that's what we're going to get into as we read on because we don't need any more sacrifices because we are atoned for and that is good news so he continued on and every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins and this is the one the way we know we know that this was before the temple was completely shut down 
Yes. Um, because they were still sacrificing. Um, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Amen. sat down on the right hand of God from there on forth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Because by one offering, he has perfected, that is finished or completed forever, them that are sanctified. And this is very key. Anyone who is in this category, them that are sanctified, Jesus has, by one offering, completed them forever. And this is emphatic language. It's used multiple times throughout the Bible. So we have our assurance of salvation. Now that we've trusted in him and we're born anew, we have assurance. And then um, that's related to him expecting his enemies to be made his footstool. So it's saying that his victory of overcoming his enemies is in him atoning for our sins. The context here is the enemies being our condemnation under sin, and he defeated that when death could not hold him. And the text goes on. Um, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says Yehovah. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So this offering is an animal sacrifice. Yep. Now what remission means is the letting away of or casting off of. Right. So where there is the casting off, of sins and iniquities, there is no more sacrifice for sin. And that's what I was saying before, that we no longer sacrifice animals because it's an insult to what Christ did, which we'll read in just a second, that um, because he actually has defeated our sins and iniquities, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, so because of that, therefore, have brothers boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So, Fred, I don't know how much you know about um, the Old Testament temple ritual, but maybe I should um, run through what's being said here and make sure it's understood. So, because Jesus Christ's sacrifice does atone for us and he is so worthy, therefore, we have boldness to enter into the holiest. Now, what the holiest was was it was the deepest chamber of the temple where right. only the high priest could enter only once a year. Yes. First, he had to atone for his own sins so that he could even enter, and then he could atone for the people's sins. Yep. And this was done once a year, every year, to atone for people's sins. It was a shadow of when Jesus would come to the cross and be the Amen. true fulfillment of truly atoning our sins. Amen. And the atonement means that um, whatever penalty we should have for our sins is satisfied instead of us paying the penalty. That's pretty much what atoning, atonement means. Yep. But um, yeah, so by the blood of Jesus, so by his worthiness, because he actually is worthy, whereas the animals just symbolized the dependence on Jesus. So right. in the old covenant before Jesus came, the ritual of sacrificing an animal and its blood that represented Jesus's sacrifice and his blood, even though they didn't know it yet because they couldn't understand what it would be. It was for when Jesus actually came in reality, that was when he was able to give us the real life example so we can understand, but they knew they were trusting in this God, um, Jehovah, and so the sacrificial system, you see, they were still saved by faith. 
It was their faith in Jesus' sacrifice that would ultimately save them. So the rituals would stop them from having an earthly death penalty. But whether or not you were saved eternally was still by faith, even if you were in the old covenant. Amen. So if you, if you had faith in the God that you were doing the sacrifices to, the one true God, um, Jehovah, then those sacrifices would be counted for you and honored. But if you didn't have faith, then those don't count. Um, anything done in faith without faith doesn't count. Right. So that's a little bit hard to explain and get into from scripture. Um, we would need another session for that. But it is true that ultimately the sacrifices in the temple were ceremonies pointing to Jesus, but it was yes. trust in the God of Jesus that actually saved them. It was their faith that saved them. So, okay, I'll continue then. Well, yeah. um, if I may add one thing real quick. Uh, okay. So the Jews were saved <clears throat> by placing their faith in what the sacrifices represented. We are saved by placing our faith and looking back at what Christ has already done. But ultimately, we both Jews and, and us Gentiles under the old and new covenant, we're, we're saved by placing our faith in the blood of the Messiah that would be shed. Yeah, and then, um, so having, therefore, because he actually is worthy to atone for our sins, and he has done so, we therefore have boldness to enter into the holiest. So that means we can enter into the holiest anytime, any of us, right? Because, um, we're in Jesus, and he is the high priest, and he is in the holiest. And so this is amazing stuff that... Um, yep, Jesus is and, the And also, it's not just the one on earth that's a shadow of the true holiest in heaven, but we actually spiritually have direct access to the Father, the holiest in heaven, even yes. now. So it's amazing stuff. You know, and, and then, in the um, Old Testament, it said that the, the high priest made intercession for the children of Israel. And I'll notice in the New Testament where it says Jesus is our great high priest ever making intercession for us. You see the you see the shadow, the type and shadow there, Fred? The Old Testament, the priest made intercession. In the New Testament is Jesus. The, the, the priest, the high priest, was a type and shadow of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the next line we're on here. So I'll continue now. By a new... Well, I want to kind of keep the flow of the text. So having therefore, brothers, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So this is why when he gave up the ghost on the cross, the veil in the temple was ripped in half, signifying that the way in was now accessible and made obvious. And this is actually spelled out in earlier chapters of the book of Hebrews. So I'm, I'm quoting scripture here when I say this, but it would take a lot of time to always go back and show it on the screen every time. But let's continue. So, um, yeah, so what he did on the cross makes the way into the holiest obvious it's incredible stuff. And of course, um, the pouring out of the spirit on Pentecost was a big part of pouring that out into the world. But let's continue here where we're at. <laughs> There's so much. And having an high priest over the house of God, referring to Jesus as our high priest, as Kevin was just saying, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So the true heart is very important because we read in Luke, and elsewhere that um, you must believe the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that belief must be with a true heart. And we don't have a true heart until God is granting it to us by grace in the process of us being reborn by faith into this new life, right? So, um, yeah, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So this refers to the sprinkling of blood that would atone for sins. So the point here is that Christ is whose blood is atoning for our sin. So um, we might not think we're worthy of being atoned, 
but we can't insult his sacrifice. If he has atoned for us, then um, we have to count that worthy. Um, let me continue reading. And our bodies washed with pure water, which refers to the new birth and the letting off of sins is the pure water. The blood refers to Christ's atonement, his worthiness, and his willingness and choice to atone for us. So it also shows his love for us, the blood. So then let me continue. Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, which just means with no inconsistency. We just totally hold to the profession of faith because he is trustworthy that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting, which means calling to our side or calling to us, calling together one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Because if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So this is where it's important to remember the context we're reading in. If we sin willfully, where it says here, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That is a reference back here. And I have looked into this, Kevin, um, since my discussion with um, Jesse, but um, there, there's a lot to explain from the Old Testament, which um, also informs what's going on here, but I don't know if we'll have to get into that today. But here, um, yeah, where remission of sins is, there is no more sacrifice for sin. That's the animal sacrifices that we no longer do. So what it's saying here is if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, it remains the case that there's no more sacrifice for sins. So the point here is that we must depend on Jesus's sacrifice and nothing else. Now, specifically, the audience it was written to were Jews who were about to face more and more persecution, and they might be tempted for the security of life amongst the Jews, and then to go back to the temple sacrifices. Um, it could also just be that someone, because they sinned willfully, they think that they need an atonement because they just can't believe that Jesus's atonement is already good enough. Not good enough, but, you know, they've sinned willfully, so now they feel like they don't deserve that atonement, but there is no other atonement that's offered. Right. There's only the cross once and for all. So we and just have to continue to, um, to trust it. That goes back to one of the solas we shared with you earlier, Fred, Christ alone. Of course. Of course it is. Yep. Uh, here comes my question. Sure. Like uh, verses 26 says, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, I mean, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. So, yes. this does, it, does it mean that uh, if a uh, man sins in the current uh, century, if man sins, uh, where does he go for, for to ask for forgiveness? Is it, does he ask God, I mean, Jesus for, for, for uh, forgiveness? Because the Bible says, sacrifice of bulls and goats is no more right exactly yeah so yeah. you still have to depend on jesus's sacrifice right and so, he can't be sacrificed again so the author's point here is to continue trusting jesus and to not turn to anything else right. um, and that's the point of the entire book of hebrews as well yes so if we if we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. It's saying that there remains no more animal sacrifice for our sins. These were Jews who were contemplating going back into the law instead of trusting the sacrifice that Christ offered. So the author here is saying that you don't need animal sacrifices anymore. Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Yeah. And so um, no more animal sacrifices needed. 
That's what he's trying to say. It's 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 just the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is enough to atone for all sin, past, present, and future. We don't need to sacrifice animals anymore. That's what he's talking about in this verse. And then, but we what we do expect is certain fearful <laughs> looking for of judgment. And fiery indignation. That's basically fiery fury or fiery anger, which shall devour the adversaries. And um, what this is referring to, the adversaries, is um, the sins. Because remember, we read back here that Jesus is expecting until his enemies are made his footstool. And what's that in context of? Well, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from here on forth or from here forward, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool because by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So the point Amen. here is that the, the victory that he over his enemies is being equated with him atoning for our sins. Um, so when we have the victory here, that he is, the fire is devouring the adversaries, um, we expect chastisement from God. And so that's where, um, Hebrews chapter 12 clarifies that. Um, and then the end of the chapter even is saying that we should, basically it's saying that we should do good works Okay, it says that if God punishes us, I'm going to summarize chapter 12 real quick so we're not doing this again with another chapter, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, we can study it later. You can read it for yourself also. But chapter 12 tells us that if God is punishing us, it's because he's dealing with us as sons. Because if someone is not punished, then they're not dealt with as sons because all sons receive punishment from their father. And... Um, so it's showing that his punishment towards us during this time is him disciplining us. It's um, a parental type of process. And then the end of the chapter, um, he comes kind of back around to that point, saying that therefore we should serve him with fear um, because our God is a consuming fire. And so that ties in here that the fire consumes our sins Therefore, instead of our sins, those are destroyed. We should be serving him. Um, and then here it says, he that despised Moses's law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the point here is that if you broke Moses's law, that's why you'd be tempted to sacrifice an animal, right? Um, yep. Because you broke Moses's law, so you need to atone for that sin. But he says... But of how much sore punishment do you suppose he shall be worthy who has trodden underfoot, that is trampled or stomped underfoot, the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unsanctified thing, and has done insult unto the Spirit of grace? So the point here is if you were to sacrifice an animal, speaking to the original audience, um, and we can apply this to any trust outside of trusting Jesus. Yes. But um, to read it, it's good to know exactly what's being said to the original audience, right? That if they were to sacrifice an animal, they would be insulting Christ's sacrifice, saying that it was not worthy against their sin. And so they would be even more worthy of death for insulting Christ's sacrifice than they were for breaking Moses' law to begin with. So he's saying that you can't sacrifice an animal to atone for your sin because that would make you even more worthy of death than you already were. Which explains the very next line. For we know him that has said, vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. So what that refers to is, in this context, what it refers to is they're trying to avenge their own sins when we just read that Christ was already victorious against our sins, the vengeance belongs to him. So that's why it's all about trusting him, because he's the one who took the revenge. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
So that again refers to the chastisement or the punishment, the discipline process that we go through. If we sin willfully, we do right. expect the discipline, but we also expect that Jesus is achieving the victory his way. So they're being told not to sacrifice animals. <laughs> right. um, I know that was a, that's a pretty long explanation. That's why I was um, hesitant to go into it. Yeah. <laughs> but ho hopefully you were able to follow that even through um, somewhat of a language barrier. Did you, uh, were you able to uh, understand what he was saying, Fred? Yeah. Okay, great. And um, the rest of the book of Hebrews verifies that, but it takes hours to um, go through that in more detail. Or you'll learn it over some months and years, you know? So um, now you have this in your pocket to keep in mind during future studies. So, okay, um, I'm not sure how we get back to where we were from here. <laughs> Oh, we were de dealing with Jesus saying, ye are gods, and I... Um, oh, I so the difference I was showing was that none of us have ever um, satisfied the Father's will. So if we go back to um, the part where, um, by the which will, we are sanctified, yep. and that's the difference between um, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, you desired not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then said he, look, I come to do your will, O God. That is Jesus he comes to actually do his will by being the sufficient sacrifice. And so, um, yeah, that's the difference between the ye are gods or O God inherit the nations. Jesus is O God inherit the nations. And it is an honor for us to be allowed to participate in that in some way and a responsibility. But we have to remember that God is perfect. Adam and Eve were made in his image, but they failed. Right. Israel was made to represent him to the world, but they failed. But Jesus actually is God. Um, so even though, yeah, even though it does say that in that text, there's such a big distinction between Jesus and the rest of us. And anything, any access we have to take part in what God has, we only have that access through Jesus, and it's still all about him. Amen. So that's the distinction. Amen. So, Fred, I know that was long, um, but I hope you got the point. Like, the, when Jesus said, ye are gods, it's not, it's not meaning they are literally gods. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I know that that's rampant in the word of faith doctrine, but it's they take it out of context. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because the, the main point of that text is that they were not living up to their responsibility as servants of God. And he, God, was calling them out for it and then right. telling them how much better Jesus is going to be than they are. If we remember from the psalm we were reading... So yep. then the question is, are there other proof texts that say similar things? Because if the only proof text about people being God is this warning about being bad stewards of what God gives you, then um, I think you see how that doesn't necessarily make the same case as what's being taught in the Word of Faith movement, right? So I don't know if there's if there's other texts that also make the same argument, but that one by itself I don't think does that well because it's more of a warning of um yeah, it's kind of ironic a little bit. Go ahead. You were saying something, Fred? All right. Mm, okay, maybe later. Later on. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we're not gods. Um, well, there's only one God. Um, so the next thing I wanted to possibly address is the idea of our faith being able to bring things into existence or our ability to speak things to existence. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, no. Yeah, go ahead. I am very tired now, brother. I should 
check out. Okay. But also, um, yeah, it'll be good. Um, I'll be listening for a while and stuff. Yeah, no, no problem, Nicholas. Thanks for uh, joining. You know, it's a pleasure to have you as always. You're welcome, and um, thank you guys. Yeah, um, thanks for taking the time with us, Fred. Um, I really appreciate that. Embraced. Yep. See you later, Nicholas. Mm. All right, Fred. Um. So I was hoping I wanted to go maybe to Matthew 17 and go down to like verse 20. Okay. So Jesus said to them, mm-hmm. because of your unbelief, verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a mm. grain of mustard seed, mm. you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Okay. So first I wanted to point out that he's saying that if you have faith as a, the grain of a mustard seed. So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus spoke this to them, the mustard seed was the smallest seed on the earth. Well, it's not mm. the smallest seed anymore today because man messing with gene splicing and things like that. But Jesus was saying that it's not your faith. It's not the amount of faith you have that allows things to happen. It's just the fact that you have faith in him at all. Right. Okay. There was another man uh, later in the New Testament where his daughter was um, ill. She was dying. And he came up to Jesus and he was asking Jesus if he can heal his daughter, if he can save her. And he said, if thou believest, all things are possible. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Mm. So this man, this man had very, very little faith. But because he had faith in Christ at all, Christ still did it. So this verse here, it's not literally saying we can remove mountains and stuff. Jesus is just making the point. That if you trust him, all things are possible. You, this this verse isn't say, you can't literally walk up to a mountain and make it move. Like Jesus was just using that as an example. Like that's not meant to be taken literal. But the point that Jesus was trying to get across is that even if you just believe a little bit, even if you just have a small bit of faith in him, that's good enough. As long as you're trusting him, it's about mm. it's about where your faith is, not how much of it you have, or how great your faith is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. The thing is concerning faith. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people they take it unseriously, especially the believers, people who who congregate in churches who always go and and fellowship. Mm-hmm. Some people they take the word the, the word faith uh unserious because uh multiple number of people you know they shift from one one church to another one church to another you know yeah simply because where they the where they are fellowshipping from for example if this is a church and this is another church. They will leave this church to go to another church. You know, that they are looking for a blessing. You know, not knowing that uh, they have failed to put their faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, one, one, uh, I was in a church and then because this pastor uh he will just come preach the word and then he stands and say i'm praying for you in the name of jesus uh, may god do whatever you want you want you know kind of but some people they were like this man has no power see because uh, he's not touching them and they are like this man this pastor doesn't have power so they have failed to understand the real word of god that is through reading the word and trusting and having faith in jesus christ is when you receive 
whatever you you ask for just as he, he said that whatever you will ask in my name my father will do it so some people they are failing to trust jesus to have faith in jesus and rather and rather they are looking at how is this pastor does he has have power you see such kind of things that's why people are failing well i would say that no one has power it is only god that has power and when god answers prayer it's because god chose to answer the prayer it's not the power of the person yeah so romans like 8 26 right here says likewise the spirit also helps our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought to but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered and he that searches the heart knoweth was the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of god right mm -hmm. yeah so god only answers prayers if it's in accordance to his will for you for instance like you know i've been going through problems with my back i can pray every day heal my back lord heal my back but if he if it's not in his will that my back is healed it won't be healed i can't make god do things um it's 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 up to him i can't control that but i can i can keep praying but it doesn't mean he's necessarily going to heal my back because he might have a reason for me to have back problems but the point is i'm just trying to show you is that god answers prayer if it's in accordance of his will god doesn't always answer and give us what we want because sometimes what we want and what he wants is two different things okay but god does promise us in the next verse here we know that all things work together for the good to those that love god to them who are called according to his purpose. Yeah. And if you are someone who is born again, uh, been made new, had the rebirth, you are, you are called according to his purpose. So we have that promise. Even though sometimes he may not answer our prayers, he promises that all things work together for the good of those who love him and who are called to his purpose. Um, so yeah, that's another thing that is rampant in the word of faith stuff is that they believe that uh, they can just say things and it happens. You know, if you have enough faith, you can say this and it ha and that's not, that's, it's not true. Um, the word of God doesn't say that. And that's why I was trying to show you. Um, Cause there was another verse in one of the gospels where Jesus says, if you believe and ask in my name, you shall receive it. But then he uses the scriptures to show that only if it's in accordance with the will of God, will you receive it. That's the condition. It's upon the will of God. Yes. That we receive whatever we ask. What's that? Uh, it's upon uh, God's will that he, whatever we ask, he does for us. If it's in accordance to what he wants for us to have. Like I can, I can say... Uh, I'm praying for a brand new car, right? And right. I could pray it every day, but if God doesn't want me to have a car, I'm not going to have the car. doesn't matter how much I speak it, how much I believe I can have the new car. If God does not will for me to have the car, I cannot have it. It's only what's in accordance by his will that I receive. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. D you agree or... Yeah, yeah, I do agree because uh, oh, great. Uh, one preacher said in God's kingdom, there's no dust been for our prayers. So meaning that uh, any prayer that you send to God is still pending for the right time. <laughs> when the right time, when the appropriate time comes, Yes. Your yes. the prayer is answered. Even if uh we we, we look at uh, Abraham, you know, mm -hmm. 
Abraham is one of the most great example that we have we look unto. How at what age did he receive his first son or child? It was because of the faith that he had in God that one day the God I serve will do for me this and this. It's uh, actually it takes our waiting time for God's uh, time to fulfill what we ask from Him. You know, uh, we might okay. I might have prayed for something some ten years back, and up to now I haven't received it. But this doesn't guarantee me that God has not or God has failed to do something that I asked from him. No, I just have to, to still hope and have faith in God that one day he will do it for me. You hear what I'm saying? Um, yeah, then, um... When, when Abraham had that faith, it was because God promised it. But I do agree with you that um, just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't happen. But um, I want to focus for a moment on the scripture that Kevin had. And I think it might help um, hone in on our differences here, which is why I came back in. Oh, but if you'll use my screen share, please, um, just so that I can um, kind of control how I'm showing it. Uh, but um is it on okay cool and he that searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit or what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of god um oh i didn't go back quite enough pardon me <laughs> so can you can you tell what book and um chapter this is from nicholas yeah we're in romans 8 i'm in the same <laughs> section you were in Yep, thank you. Um, so I'm at verse 24 now. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? And of course, what you were just saying agrees with that. So um, I understand that. But let me continue here. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? And then it continues here. Likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities. Well, infirmities means our um, shortcomings or weaknesses or injuries. And so, um, yeah, the spirit helps our shortcomings because we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so I think this sort of highlights my point that it's less about like um, trusting and our, it, it, it's not that it's not about trusting, but it's really about who our trust is in. Like it even says right here that we actually don't know what we should pray for. And so we require the spirit to pray for us prayers that we don't know to pray because otherwise we wouldn't pray all the things we need to pray the spirit prays for us um i think this really emphasizes how much it's about god's will and about us conforming to god's will because even when our prayers are mistaken the spirit corrects that for us you know yeah um I mean, what do you think of that in context of praying for things and expecting them? What if you pray for something, but you don't know what you should pray for, and the Spirit instead intercedes for you and prays to God something else for you, right? And then you, you see what I mean? Yeah. So... Um, Okay, and I don't want to take over the whole discussion from you guys, but I did um, want to point out where I think the scripture highlights that difference. Yeah, I appreciate that, Nicholas. And um, any thoughts on that, Fred? Okay, uh, that that with that uh, verse, uh, it takes us to 
to these girls who were waiting for the for the bride you know uh who uh the this is two group the two group of people who were waiting for the bride one who used up their light you know and to go to fed up and these ones who kept their light when the bride came they had to to use their light so it means that we need the first of all we need hope in our life hope in god we need the hope in god or we need to have hope in god and then we need faith two things we need to hope in god and we need faith to have faith that's when things like for example if i have been praying for something for over 10 years back and after now I haven't received it it doesn't mean that i should lose hope that god won't do it because i believe that god can do anything or can do it for me in the appropriate time then it means i will have hope in god that one day this and this will happen but but what if god doesn't answer that prayer the word of god doesn't answer that prayer yeah what if he doesn't answer that prayer that, that one thing you've been praying for yeah if you have been praying for something for for a long time mm -hmm. and god has not yet answered it yet that that one, that one doesn't guarantee you to lose hope in god that he won't do it it means that in the appropriate time he will do it yeah well fred my mother mm. got saved in the early 90s or the mid 90s right and ever since that relationship between her and my dad had not been good my mom prayed for oh i don't know 20 25 years or so for my dad to get saved and for god to fix their marriage right yeah. in 2011 <clears throat> my dad passed away that prayer was never answered now my mom did not lose faith in god because her trust is in christ her trust wasn't in her prayer and she realizes that maybe that wasn't god's will for her life and she accepted that yeah so so that's a real life example sometimes god does not answer certain prayer only if it's in accordance to his will does he answer prayer. And um, I do think this is the right moment for me to, um, I think we could do Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. Um, and I think that'll make a very good point. And this will be a lot easier than what we just did before, Fred. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, because um, it's the chapter that's all about faith. But then... Um, because what Fred is saying about not losing faith and not giving up faith and going to doubt instead, there's a yes. lot of truth in that. And that's what I was kind of mentioning earlier, that it makes this a difficult topic to address because right. there is a lot of truth that God is so worthy of our faith. Right. Um, so, you know, um, the New Testament talks about um, telling us to rightly divide the word of god or um to straightly cut straight cut right yeah. um the word of god and so um that's the thing is i very much um agree with what fred was just saying so let's read the faith chapter yes. and then when it comes to um the distinction i want to make i'll point it out <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> okay now Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if I may say, I've looked into this before, it's um, faith is the undergirding of our hopes, the evidence of things not seen is um, another good way to translate it and understand it exactly. But um, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, mm -hmm. 
we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And mm -hmm. by it, he being dead, yet speaks. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Can you for... pause for a moment, Nicholas? Um, sure. Um, Fred, I just wanted to point out, so when the when the Bible uses the word faith, it is interchangeable with the word trust. So when anytime it says faith, it means trust. So it's saying by trust, Enoch was yeah. translated by tr So the, and the point that, that trust is that they are trusting God. So by, by their trust in God, Enoch was translated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to point that out. Continue, Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, by trust, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing to where he went. By faith, he sojourned, that is like um, to travel as sort of a camper, I guess, as a guest. Yeah. yeah. Um, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, because he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of child when she was past age because she judged him faithful, or that means she judged him trustworthy, who had promised. Mm -hmm. Therefore, sprang there even one, referring to Isaac being born when it was impossible, and him yeah. as good as dead. There sprang also as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable, innumerable, uh, means uncountable. Yep. Um, these all died in Trust. faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Because they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that from whence they had come out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city by faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise up Isaac even from the dead, from where he also received him, figuratively speaking. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, 
when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach <clears throat> that is to be basically chastised and corrected um, by Christ, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going on for a long time here. Give me just one moment. Okay. Hopefully that helps. Here we go. So um, yeah, I'll back up just a little bit so we're in the flow of the text. Um, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, because he had respect unto the repayment of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they, they were surrounded about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? Because the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David also and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, grew valiant in fight, turned to fleeing the armies of the foreigners, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of mockings and scourgings, yeah, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stone, they were sawn asunder, that means sawn in half. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these, all having obtained favorable report, through faith, received not the promise, but, um, oh, sorry, it doesn't say, but <laughs> having received not the promise, um, God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. And so it's the perfection in the end, in the eternity, that is the ultimate promise, the better thing that is provided for us. Amen. And I think... Um, that might be the heart of what Kevin and I want to emphasize is that for some people, what we have in store for us is to wander about in sheepskins and goatskins. Being um, destitute means impoverished, right? Being impoverished and afflicted. Yes. And um, 
not receiving the promises, but having some better thing in store for us. Um, even a better resurrection, referring to better rewards in the life to come, even. So, um, well, I hope that was useful. <laughs> but, but do you see what I mean that this chapter is so much on faith? But, oh, one last thing I want to convey here, just one last thing, that um, what the writer is getting at here is that even when we're going through such hardships, that's not a reason to doubt. Just like those who were in scripture, some of them went through such hardships. And so the point the author has here is to encourage us, no matter what, to continue to believe. So I, I do want to make sure we get the author's main point as well as what we're talking about here. But do you see how this speaks to what we're talking about that... Um, I agree with you very much about faith, but it also goes very much with God's will and is not always going to, yeah, sometimes it'll bring us through um, even extreme persecution, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so do, do you see, Fred, that there's some people that... Um never received the promise of God, but, but better things, God had better things waiting for them. Mm -hmm. So th there are people, you know, I'm sure that the, a lot of the children of Israel are probably praying, you know, to God, like, can we please enter the promised land? Can we get out of the wilderness? But they were there for 40 years and a lot of the, there was a whole generation that actually died without seeing it. Even Moses uh, wasn't allowed to enter the promised land because he struck the rock twice. So <laughs> we see that even but, the patriarchs and, and there's people that, you know, gave us parts of the scripture by inspiration through the Holy Spirit that they didn't receive some of the things that they were asking for either. And this emphasizes the importance of faith, but it's really all about that our trust is in Jesus because um, that's one of the motifs or um, one of the ways the book of Hebrews depicts it is that entering the promised land is to em enter the Sabbath rest of assurance of salvation because we trust Jesus. Mm -hmm. And those who didn't enter were those who did not trust him, who did not have faith. And so... Um, well, Moses, Moses did, but he still didn't enter either. <clears throat> yeah, but um, the action that he was left out for was because... Um, I think the best interpretation is that he was shortcoming in faith when he hit the rock twice. Uh, well, yeah, because that rock represented Christ. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then he hit it once and nothing came out and he hit it again. But there's various interpretations. So I don't want to really open that can of worms. Yeah, yeah. Because um, what I think we all know we always have assurance of is that better thing that he has provided for us. And that's our in eternal inheritance in the age to come, in the life to come, the resurrection. So I, I mean, I do presume that you believe in the resurrection and the life to come, right, Fred? Yeah. Okay. And I was just checking because... Um, I don't know you, so without asking, I don't know. It might seem like a given, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Obtaining faith. According to the scripture. And according to how people used his people, uh, how God used his people, and how they walked with him, I think that guarantees us also to to have the same faith that. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, the faith that they had in God. That's what we 
we all opt to to have we need in order to to receive what god has promised for us or what god is to give us we need to obtain the the faith in him in jesus christ we need to have that faith uh, just as uh, verses uh, 39 says and these or having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise right you know? they saw a good report of faith but they did not receive the promise yes if i told they they had faith but they did not uh uh i mean having obtained a good report through faith yeah if at all they had faith but they did not receive what god had promised them because he said that uh god, told, god said he are their descendants well, let, let me make sure there's not something lost in translation here. When it says they received not the promise, it actually just means that they did not receive it yet because they're going to receive it at the resurrection. Yes. Um, it, it doesn't spell all that out, but that, that I just want to make sure we know that that's what that means. It's not saying that these are people who are right. not saved or something. Right. It's saying that they have not received it yet, but they will at the resurrection. Yes, they will inherit New Jerusalem, and they will inherit the New Heaven and New Earth, even though they didn't see the Promised Land while they were yet alive. So, so this one, uh, this means that uh, God, when God promised uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the blessing, and then in the end and actually uh in the actual sense they received a little of what he had promised them yeah and I, I think something key to consider is that um it was god who promised that to abraham it wasn't that abraham had the power to make that happen by his faith but he was promised to have in isaac his seed would be called and he trusted that promise so much that he was even willing to sacrifice Isaac, trusting that God could raise him from the dead. Um, and I think the reason he didn't have him sacrifice Isaac and then raise Isaac from the dead is because that was Jesus's role to be the one who actually dies and rose from the dead. So, yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay, I mean, I think I've made um, kind of what I'm trying to convey pretty clear, because that is the difference, right? It's not that Abraham had the power to decide Isaac would be born, but when it was promised to him by God, he did trust it. So I yeah. think um, that's the distinction I'm talking about, is not, um, not that I would discourage faith at all, but I would um, yes. discourage to think that um, we... Um, that our will can be guaranteed by faith. It's only God's will that is guaranteed. Right. Um, and then if we are having faith in him, then we're going to expect the things of him, and those are the things that are guaranteed. I know that's a funny way to say it, but hopefully it made some sense. Oh, and can I point out something else too? So Abraham did see the promise of Isaac, but God also promised Abraham that he'd make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands of the sea. Abraham yeah. died before he could see how many Jews there would be. So he didn't physically witness that other promise, but God still did it. So there are things that come to pass. Sometimes they happen not in your lifetime, but in the long run, Abraham will meet all of his children because we will all inherit the new heaven and new earth. And he will see all the children that are numerous, just like God promised him. But he didn't see it during his lifetime. And that's how it is sometimes. There's things that we pray for and pray for, and we may never see it during our lifetime, but we gain everything in eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one brings us to also 
uh, King David when God uh, asked him to build to build him a house or a temple and later he said your son or your descendant oh I will choose or you will choose from your children who will build me a house and that is Solomon so uh, if this is a Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 where God promised promised Abraham and uh, and all he, of his descendants it means that uh, if at all God has not done something in your life that you prayed for that all that you, you asked from him and your children and it might it might come in the line of your children. Oh, your children might receive. Oh, if you die and you have no, you have not received what I, what God has promised you, or what God has had promised to do for you, then it means that in your descendants, your children, they will receive, or the God might bring it through your children well yeah for abraham because god promised him <clears throat> so that was guaranteed but um i would what is promised to us today is that we those who trust on him will never perish we're promised that he's made a, a, a dwelling place for us that he will receive us to himself he'll come back for us those are the promises that we have um but other than that we don't have any other promises in fact jesus told us that we will suffer persecution we will have tribulation on this world and people will hate us for his namesake because they persecuted him first they will persecute us also so god promises us trouble if you want to look at it that way in this life he doesn't guarantee us wealth and prosperity like um, a lot of people like to say in fact it's the opposite christian isn't being a christian isn't for sissies because we're promised persecution and tribulation um, and every Christian goes through persecution and tribulation at some point in one way or another. Um, so yeah, the promises I look forward to is a new body at the rapture of the church. I look forward to a home in new Jerusalem and I look forward to inheriting the new heaven and the new earth and spending eternity with the God who made me, Jesus Christ. Other than that, um, I don't expect anything else. I pray for other things, and if God chooses to bless me with some of those things, then amen. But if not, then still amen. Yeah, amen. and um, I, I do agree that God may well um, <clears throat> carry prayer over to another generation and bring that blessing later if he wants. Um, but here I have Matthew 6 up to um, kind of bring together one last quick point, I think. Um, wherefore, if God so clothes, so this is Jesus talking to disciples or to a crowd, maybe. Um, wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? or wherewith shall we be clothed for after all these things do the gentiles seek um for your heavenly father your heavenly father knows that ye have need of all these things but instead seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you um, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is, it says evil here, this is probably um, hardship, the hardship thereof. And um, so my point here is that I think it's emphasizing again our agreement with the Father's will, that we don't need to pray for the things we want because he knows what we need. But... Um, mm -hmm but rather seek the kingdom of God 
and what God has for us will be added to us. And so seeking the kingdom of God, I would argue, focuses us again on um, God's will. Yep. Right. And um, that's where I do put trust is that if it's God's will, it will be done. Um, yes. Actually, it's uh, about looking unto God for a, for all that we we need for Him to provide. Like, uh, if, if the Bible says that uh, if at all your heavenly Father feeds the ravens, yeah, then will He not uh, do anything? than the ravens will he not provide you whatever you need it means that we need we should look unto god for all things to, to work into our lives or for yeah. all things to happen in in uh in our lives and i think we agree there in that you would also agree that um looking to god for the things in our lives also means that we seek to be obedient to him knowing that he blesses obedience and also just because we love him but um right so i think we agree there too that um seeking to him for things also means that if we put effort towards things we got to make sure we're godly in that because that's going to him for it right putting effort in yeah. in a godly way yeah um okay very good i appreciate you hearing me out on that because i did um want to convey that you know we're not just totally against faith or anything but there right, is right. um a distinction there between yeah Amen. how much um it's focused on the father's will and what we can expect in faith as opposed to what we don't have a promise of necessarily but God does a lot more than what's in the written promises. And, um, you know, I think it's it's possible for someone to understand that God has given them a promise. Um, but at the same time, I think it's possible for people to imagine promises that God has not given them. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I don't, like, seek to get a promise. But um, I do walk in faith a lot, right? Like um, all the work that I do, I'm only able to have a conversation like this with you that's meaningful because I did a lot of walking in faith and learned a lot along the way. And um, not knowing what I would find later on, but knowing that I could trust God that it would be good. Which also brings us back to the scripture that Kevin shared earlier, that um, all things work out for the good of those who love him. And so then, while the it even says that we don't necessarily know the things we should pray for, so the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, praying those things that we ought to pray. But then the very next thing it says is that we do know that all things work out for our good. And um, I think that's a good description of um, what we should expect in our faith walk, perhaps, right? Yep. Amen. I, I agree with that, uh, Nicholas. What, what do you um, what do you think about um, what Nicholas just said, Fred? Yeah. Uh, true. That's true. All things work out for the good. Uh, meaning that uh, walking in the righteous, in the righteous way, is how God looks unto. Okay. 
in order in order for us to receive what he promised us because the bible uh the bible clears clearly tells us that if we disobey we shall not eat the good things from god but we have to be humble obedient That's when we shall receive the good things from from God. Just as uh, just like uh, if you uh, if you have your parents, if you if you're not obedient at home, I guarantee you the parents cannot you know cannot offer you whatever you ask from them because you're disobedient. That is, that's that's uh, that the same thing that implies to in the kingdom of God that if you are disobedient to God, then it means that uh, you are not entitled to eat the fruits or the good fruits or to get or to receive what God promised. Because, uh, of course, we all uh, we are all entitled to receive good things from God. Right, but I'd ask, what is it that God has promised to us? Good headed. No. Riches of the earth. No. Nope. God, God promises us eternal life. God promises us a new body. God promises us new heaven and new earth. Um, but as far as wealth and material goods, God does not promise us that. I'm sorry, you won't find it in scripture, Fred. Uh, Jesus never promised that we'll have prosperity, wealth, finances, health. Um, but he told us that <laughs> we'll have tribulation, we'll have trials, we'll have persecution. People and will hate that, us because of him. And that we have some better thing waiting for us. Right. Now, now it is true that sometimes God does bless some of his children with wealth and uh, nice material things, but that's not something he gives to all of his children um, because the love of money is the root of all evil. And God knows that if he gave wealth to some people, they would go off too far with it. They would take their eye off him and they would love their materials instead of him. So he doesn't bless all of his children with wealth um, like that. I know a lot of the prosperity or word of faith people will say that, you know, God wants you to be rich and this and that, but that's not true. You won't find that anywhere in scripture. And, um, but, um, but if you are trustworthy to him and obedient to him and such, then it's more likely that he's going to want to steward you with money um, right. in that sense. But then you're going to be using it rightfully, um, yes. of course. So he, he knows how to give money to his favorite stewards. But also, um, it's less about, for how God does things, it's less about actually financial assets and stuff. It's more about spiritual assets. Yes. You know? Like... Um, truth and light and um bringing clarity to people and helping them um learn the doctrines of god and i think um those things do a lot um they do eventually do a lot to make the world better but they right. also do a lot to offer the gospel which is the only thing that can offer people life without the gospel they will perish but with the gospel they will live forever and then that's just an amazing thing. Amen. And if okay. I could share real quick, okay. sorry, for, can I share one thing before you go ahead? Um, so here in Mark 14, 35, so this is Jesus. Um, he was about to be crucified. 
He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things possible unto thee, take away this cup from me. Jesus was praying that, that God would deliver him out of what was to come if, it, if, it, if he would. But then what did Jesus say? Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou, that's singular. So he's saying, but whatever you will, God. So Jesus was praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. He's talking about his crucifixion to come. But then he said, but not what I want, but what you want. So <laughs> you see that Jesus, part of him was asking that the cup would pass, but he was willing, he was, he was obedient unto death. Mm -hmm. So do you see here that even Jesus, let this cup pass for me. And the, But he said, not what I want, but what you want, Father. And the Father's will was that Christ be obedient to death and die on the cross. Mm -hmm. yes. So even Jesus understood that his prayer had to be aligned in accordance to the Father's will. And um, Jesus was saying, if you will it, let this cup pass for me. But the Father did not will that. He wanted him to go to the cross. So Jesus was obedient and went to the cross. <laughs> so even the Son was obedient to the Father's will. Okay. Yeah. And what were you going to say, Fred? Uh, just say uh, Mark chapter 10, uh, verses, uh, uh, verses 30, but uh, we shall begin from verses 29. Mark 10. Where, the, where Jesus said, I should I say to you, there is no one who has left the house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake. And the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with the persecution and in the age to come eternal life okay verses, uh, verses 31 uh, it says but many who have who are first will be last and the last will be. okay what i want to bring here is uh if at all just as uh, it says here for for uh for my sake and the gospels uh -huh. for my sake and the gospel it means that if we follow jesus following jesus is is what we call number one priority well yes trusting him would be the number one priority and because you trust him you will follow him so following him is number two trusting him is number one mm -hmm. right who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time you know but um, may may I suggest that he's um, using this to refer to gaining each other, <clears throat> that we have gained you, Fred, and you have gained me and Kevin, and that all the church have gained one another, and that is the hundredfold that we have now in this time. And he explains that here in this verse. See that right here, Fred. He explains what the hundredfold is. How it says, <laughs> brothers and sisters and mothers and children. And lands. Yeah, so um, the how the word houses here would refer to households. So right. they talked about houses back then. You and all of your house referred to you and all of your household. Yes. So um, speaking of like your... the man of the house and um, mm -hmm. his wife and kids, and if other people lived with him or slaves or anything like that. Yeah. So the hundredfold, what he's talking about, you'll receive is is talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not talking about material. Amen. It's, it's talking about we receive each other. I received my brother Nicholas and Graham at some of the lowest points of my walk with Christ, and they they um, helped strengthen me and, and um, correct me in things where I was wrong. So, th so that was a great blessing that I received a hundredfold because I was weak in my walk, and these brothers are strengthening me and helping me grow in the knowledge and wisdom in the Word of God. 
So I have received a hundredfold blessing through my brothers. Okay. Yep. And that's also why it says with persecutions, because that's part of being the church also. Yes. <laughs> that way we yes. get our we persecutions. But, See, but in, many, in the world to come, eternal life. And here in this verse, but many that are first, who is first now in this life? Politicians, the rich, right? The wealthy. They that are first will be last. And we, the church that are last, we will be first because we will have the riches in the end. We will inherit the new heaven and new earth. We have mansions in new Jerusalem. We will be made first and the rich shall be made desolate and poor. They will be last. They will be yeah. cast into everlasting fire. We will be made rich in Christ. And may I say, sometimes the persecution, like a lot of what I experience, is that, um, you know, I can't just go out and make money easily um, and also achieve the things that I want to achieve for the kingdom. It's kind of like um, the, the, the economy is not necessarily set up for us to... Um, Well, I mean, but hold on. Uh, before, um, before we move on, though, I just want Fred to see that. Like, so, Fred, do you do you understand what the hundredfold that they receive is now here? The brothers and the sisters and their mothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah, I do now understand. All right, good, good. Um, I'm not and, uh, trying to be rude or anything. I just, I just wanted to make sure that you, um, you saw that. That's all. Okay. And, um, uh, just a moment. Uh, when is the last meeting uh, and, uh, and uh, next meeting? When when will it be? Oh, meeting? I was going to actually uh, ask what, what what day is good for you. So I want to make sure it's a day where you have off, so that we can talk for a while. You know. Yeah, twenty fourth, twenty fifth, and uh, twenty nine and the third day. All right. So the twenty fourth is that a Tuesday? Monday and Tuesday. 24th then, of the Monday? Yeah. Okay, so let's do the 24th. And what time is good for you? Actually, I will have all the time. All the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because that day I'll be off. Okay. Well, Maybe well, starting a little off. earlier would be nice on our end. Yeah. Yeah. And these other days uh, before 24th, uh, like the same time that I joined you, it's very okay, so like five, you're, so you're talking about like five a.m. my time. Would it yeah. would you be possible for you to join around like like maybe yeah. midnight or one o'clock my time? One o'clock. One a.m. Yeah, so one a.m. my time was seven hours. Maybe, ago. maybe the same time that I I joined you now. Today. What time? Did he, what time did he join, Nicholas? Was it five? Uh. It was, uh, it was, uh, let me see, uh, six, five. Yeah, because it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning for me. It was, it was three, around three. It was around three, three, time. three, three p.m. your time, or, or you're talking about three a.m. my time? Your time, three a.m. Okay. My time, it was one o'clock. All right, so 3, 3 a.m. on the 24th, my time. because Yeah, because when you joined the stream this time, it was like 5 o'clock. Well, I think it was like maybe 4. Oh, yeah, it was it was getting close to 5, your yeah. time. That's right. But yeah. um, I don't know. Um, what scripture were we just at looking at? Um, it was uh, Mark. Oh, you 10. already have it up now. Yeah. So I just want to mention where it says with persecutions, um, sometimes the persecutions, um, well, literally in the early church, a lot of them were plundered, meaning that all their goods were stolen. And that would um, be one of the more common forms of persecutions that they underwent for becoming Christian. Um, I'm not sure exactly why that happened, but there's references to it in scripture. But then also... Um, what I was mentioning was sometimes we turn down a job for some reason due to our ethics or something, and that can be a form of persecution, and that's where we end up with less money because we're devoted to God, you know? 
So there, there's a lot of possibilities as to um, what it means for us to inherit each other and inherit eternal life and to also have persecutions with it and to seek the kingdom of God and for God to provide for us from there after, you know? Because, um, yep. yeah, so I'll, I'll leave all that at that. And then yep. also the thing that I always focus on, which is um, to just trust Jesus Christ, or the way I like to put it, just trust Messiah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Okay. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, my time is up. Maybe. Okay. So, Fred, the 24th at 3 a.m., um, we'll do this. We'll do the stream. I'll send you the uh, the link um, on the Facebook Messenger, and you can just click on it and and join. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I'll call that one part two, and then um, you know, hopefully we can keep having you come back, and we can keep doing studies and going over things. And that video I shared with you, um, if you wouldn't mind watching that, and then maybe yeah. we can talk about that next time. Yeah, I do watch it. I do watch, right, watch them. Yeah. All right, great, Fred. That sounds awesome, man. Thanks for thanks for coming and talking with us. Okay, and a nice time too. Yep, and I will. I'll I'll see you on the twenty on the twenty fourth. Okay. Okay. All right, Fred. No problem. But uh, if you if you uh, if you don't mind, next time maybe tomorrow or the other day or next day or what, you can share. You can send me the link. Maybe if I have time, so I can join. It. I got you live okay. all right um well Graham stream streams on a regular basis so if you want to check in at Graham's channel he usually has an open chat where you can just join in anytime he usually puts the streamyard link in the chat on his YouTube so you can just join oh. his channel and then click on the chat and join in and you can I'm usually over at Fred's channel or um Graham's channel a lot too so you I'll be over there often as well if you want to subscribe to Graham's channel I put the yeah, link yeah I did I did already I did yeah, already. Yeah. yeah yeah so that's probably the best place to catch me if you want to talk before uh, the 24th cuz I'm I'm usually over at Graham's channel almost every day um uh, <laughs> but yeah so but for my channel um I have I'll schedule it after we get offline I'll put it I'll set it up for the 24th at 3 a.m. my time okay all right. Yeah. All right. Take care, Fred, and um, yeah, grow in uh, wisdom and knowledge, man. And uh, we'll, I'm, I'll love to d discuss what you learned and, um, you know, things you may have disagreed with about the video, and uh, you know, we'll we'll go over all this stuff together. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, we have to grow together in the in the heaven realm, the spirit of with the, you know, things concerning heavenly. You know, we need to grow together. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, Nicholas, thank you so much for being here, man. I really appreciate you, man. Um, <clears throat> great, great brother in the Lord, man. Awesome. And uh, Fred, thanks for being here, man. You're welcome. And everyone that watched, thanks for the support. And uh, don't forget to like and uh, subscribe. And uh, stay tuned for next time for part two of our discussion with Fred Kabagaza. <laughs> okay, nice time too. Yeah. Take care, Fred. Bye bye. Good night.